Now another product is wrought iron. Okay, so where cast iron, uh, you know, uh, we already talked, cast iron has two to four percentage carbon. Now this is wrought iron which we are talking, which is slightly different in microstructure. Let's see what is the difference. It has less than about one percent carbon. Okay, whereas in cast iron you had two to four percent carbon and one to two percent slag. Okay, that's the key, uh, you know, thing there. A key ingredient now. So, you have both carbon and 1 to 2 percent slag is there, mainly silicon, phosphorus, sulfur, these are the contents which are present in the slag. Now, because of this, there will be a formation of a grain structure. Okay, as we have recalled this, you might remember this image in uh, when we in, in the nature of materials module, we had a de detailed discussion on these grains. You can see grains in different directions and all that grain boundaries grain all this we discussed and then these grain boundaries helps in preventing the crack propagation uh, so they have a significant role on the mechanical properties etc now how is this made so it's uh, it's heated and then worked and this worked is kind of the rot word is coming from the word worked so, it is similar to a strain hardened or you know that kind of process. So, it is uh, you know bent uh, you know and, and during the manufacturing process, it is not just casting like in case of cast iron. Here you also have a uh, you know cold working involved when we talk about the uh, wrought iron. Okay. Now, uh, main thing is it has slag also as an ingredient and so slag, carbon and iron, these are the three main ingredients and because of which you have a grain formation and because of the grain formation, its and mechanical properties are very different as compared to cast iron and uh, ductile iron and it is lighter and stronger, okay. it is lighter and stronger. So, because of this lighter and stronger that kind of properties it is used in many engineering applications. One of the uh, you know first application is wrought iron, I mean uh, noticeable application is wrought iron um, used in Eiffel Tower okay. and also in Statue of Liberty. The frame inside the what you see when you see the Statue of Liberty, the green uh, you know the shell is uh, made of bronze but or copper element. but the inside the frame is made out of wrought iron because it has high strength and it is lighter. When you talk about these large structures, the dead load or the total weight of the structure also have to be minimized. If the total weight is going to be very, very high, then what you, you will have a huge challenge of creating a good foundation that also will become very big. So, general there is a need for reducing the total weight of the structure. So, that is why they go for lighter material or less dense material, less dense okay, or density is less and strength is high. So, uh, this is just an image inside view, this one inside view of the uh, frame inside the Statue of Liberty. These are all collected from the internet. You can see also these different, uh, you know, um, are aesthetically pleasing shapes for various, uh, you know, applications in buildings, fences, etc. Wrought iron is widely uh, used. Okay. Now, um, yeah, and it's less harder than the cast iron also. Okay, because of the reduction in the carbon content from about 4 percentage to about 1 percentage, the hardness also decreases significantly. So, it is easier to uh, you know uh, to, to. So, there are uh, advantages and disadvantages of these various properties. So, we have to see uh, what is that you need okay, uh, for various engineering applications. Now, let us look at all these three material at once just to kind of summarize. So, you have cast iron on the left side which is mainly having flaky graphites because of that your brittleness of cast iron is very high. 
ductile ion on the middle picture, uh, ductile ion it has this globular graphite. So, the brittleness decreases, ductility increases and we call it ductile ion and both these cast ion and ductile ion has high hardness, high strength, corrosion resistant etcetera. Now, another pro uh, product was wrought ion which is having a grain structure ok, a grain structure here and it has less carbon than the cast iron or ductile iron, but it also has slag present in it ok. Now, uh, because of this presence of slag and lower quantity of carbon, this has a strength which is higher than uh, the uh, cast iron, but at the same time it also relatively light because of the presence of slag in there. You remember in that blast furnace image we saw that slag actually floats above the molten iron. So, definitely slag has uh, a density which is uh, the density of slag is less than that of the molten iron. So, when you include uh, some slag in inside the material definitely the density of the material is going to be slightly less and so it is stronger because of low carbon. So, it is a more widely I mean it is widely used for engineering applications examples we look at uh, Eiffel Tower and uh, you know Statue of Liberty and many other uh, you know typical applications in buildings. Now, let us look at steel how steel is manufactured and we will also talk why it corrodes ok. Now, steel is again similar way you get the iron like from the iron ore to the blast furnace and then you get the molten material and then you be depending on the raw materials which you put you get this particular composition of steel well controlled and steel means there is could be lot of other uh, you know elements present in that for addressing various properties essentially when you talk about alloys a lot of uh, elements uh, come into the picture. I will show up here you know uh, that details later on in the following uh, lectures and uh, then what you do is you put the steel through a mill uh, in which you get but different shapes whether it is a steel reinforcing bar like circular road or a square shape or an I section or whatever shape you talk about you pass it through some mechanical dies and then you get the steel. Then what you do you when you use the steel in construction it gets exposed to moisture uh, that is where we are talking how it corrodes ok. It gets exposed to moisture and chlorides, carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen etcetera and which leads to some of the chemical reactions and essentially what is happening is the steel has a higher energy level than the iron ore right as you heat and as you pass it through the mechanical dies both the heat energy and mechanical energy utilization is there. And so, this energy both this heat and mechanical energy thermal or mechanical energy gets stored in the heat in the steel. Now, at a material which has higher energy level will definitely try to react with the environment and tries to go back to its original energy level which is that of the iron ore. So, if you look carefully in these equations here, these are the corrosion reactions. You will see that you have ferrous hydroxides and Fe2O3 forming and then what is essentially that Fe2O3 is essentially the uh, iron ore ok. The my, uh, chemical structure or mineral structure is similar to that of the iron ore. So, even there is a uh, def definition that uh, the uh, Corro uh, corrosion is nothing but the extractive metallurgy in reverse direction ok. Extractive metallurgy in reverse. So, this is Corrosion is equal to extractive metallurgy in reverse. This is one of the definitions given in one of the NACE uh, books I remember ok. Uh, so, essentially when during the manufacturing process of steel the energy level of steel increases 
because of the heat treatment and the mechanical treatment which is given and that energy because of that high energy level when it becomes in contact with the environment it will try to go back and now this rate of corrosion you can control by various means ok. So, that that is all advanced uh, level courses we will not cover those things in this class, but what you need to know is when you talk about stainless steel this rate of corrosion is very very small as compared to a typical other steels which are used. Now, steel manufacturing process or so just another sketch here you can see here blast furnace you have raw materials and then you have blast furnace. Uh, the materials are put in the blast furnace and then either an oxygen uh, furnace or an electric arc furnace is used depending on the energy and the uh, resources available. Mostly now people are going for electric arc furnace and then you convert this the molten material is put through uh, a mechanical shape or dies or uh, and it gets into these shapes either a billet or a bloom or a slab ok. And then uh, after that it is passed through some dies where we call rolling. So, you can see these are rotating wheels here you can see here rotating wheels rotating wheels ok. There are different manufacturing processes there are some cases where the wheels are rotating and then there are some cases where it is extruded. So, different uh, you know depending on what you are making, but for this simple understanding for this class we can say that they are passed through some dies metal dies and which are harder metals ok. So, that the die does not degrade, but rather you get a different shape. So, you can see here for one example I am showing uh, where uh, you can see here on the left side you have a thicker material it is passed through a metal die two wheels you can see and as it comes to the other side. Uh, so, th this rotates like this and then this rotate like this and then it comes out and uh, you get the desired shape. So, like that depending on the shape which you want uh, you have these different processes involved ok different shapes you can make. So, different type of steels depending mainly on the carbon content that is how normally they are divided ok or classified. As you see here if the carbon content is less than 15 uh, 0.15 percentage we call it dead mild steel from 0.15 to 0.3 percentage we call it mild steel and then from 0.3 to 0.8 percentage we call it medium carbon steel and then you have high carbon steel ok and then you also have hard steel. So, you can see the different percentages and how they are uh, different or um, cast iron comes like you know 3 to 4 percentage which is higher than this, but uh, that is cast iron and we are not mixing that into here. Here we are talking about steel where the percentage is more or less less than 1 percent is what we typically uh, talk about ok. Now, how this carbon content varies this carbon content influences the tensile strength and hardness of the material. So, let us look at this uh, the solid curve here this one. So, that is a tensile ultimate strength or tensile strength of the material you can see as the carbon content increases initially the tensile strength increases and then at about 1 percentage the uh, it peaks and then if you keep on increasing then the strength decreases ok. Now, if you talk about uh, hardness, Brinell hardness is uh, discussed here where how it is done is you have a spherical ball indentation and then if you have a plate something uh, where you kind of apply a force and then you look at what is the indentation and diameter of that and etcetera. So, I mean this, this is the uh, ok. So, like this you can measure the hardness you can read more about that in uh, textbooks. But uh, what you notice here is as the carbon content increases the hardness also keep on increasing ok. Hardness also keep on increasing. Now, what about ductility? Ductility actually decreases ok. As the carbon content is increasing ductility decreases and it after the about 0.8 it does not have much of an influence, but you can see that ductility decreases. So, there is always this danger of 
uh, you know do not keep on increasing the uh, carbon content because that will definitely uh, increase the brittleness of the material or decrease the ductility of the material. So, for engineering applications considering the safety and uh, all that aspects, uh, we, we want the material or whatever material we use, we want them to be ductile in nature. To, if it is not ductile, there will be catastrophic failure because you do not realize that it is about to fail. So, that that is the main idea. So, to avoid those such uh, catastrophic failure, we re or to keep the structures flexible in nature before it collapses or it should deform significantly so that people can see that it is deforming and escape from the building or whatever facility you talk. So, you need the structures to be ductile in nature. So, we need ductile material to be used. Okay. So, ductility is very, very important aspect in, in addition to the strength uh, of the uh, materials. Now, where do we use steel in construction? One of the major uh, application is reinforcing steel. About 30 percent of the steel made in this country is used as reinforcement. It is for reinforcement okay, or these round uh, rebars which you see which is used in concrete construction about 30 percentage of all the steel which is made in the country uh, is about re, uh, rebars. Then we have structural steel where it is, so th this is an example of reinforcing steel you can see rebars and when we talk about structural steel we are talking about this trusses. Uh, plates, rear bar, uh, you know square shape or something which is not circular rebars, but pipes, structural shape means I section, angle section, uh, channel section, so many sections are there, there, there will be another lecture on that uh, coming up. And then cold formed steel, we already discussed what is cold form earlier and uh, uh, studs, truss members, roofing, cladding and of course, uh, fasteners. All these, um, uh, you know, uh, elements they need to be connected together by using either bolts, nuts, washers, etc. There also, uh, these kind of uh, different steel products are heavily uh, used. And nowadays, also, in uh, when we talk about formworks, we have steel formworks nowadays. And this is just a uh, you know quick look at different type of rebars. We'll have a detailed discussion in the next lecture. Just want you to give a feeling of this that there, there are different type of rebars uh, in the market as you can see on different pictures. Of course, there are coated rebars also. This 7, 8, 9, 10 are coated rebars. Okay, sorry, 7, 8 and 9 are coated rebars. These are coated rebars. Then this is fiber reinforced polymer rebars. So, that is just coming separate. But anyway, uh, focus is that uh, steel is used for making steel reinforcement. So, first uh, six of them you can see that they are all completely steel products. Okay. Now, uh, these are the different channel or a different uh, uh, structural steel shapes, I section and then here also you have uh, looks like I and then channel, angle, and then you have uh, you know sheet piling, uh, different shapes are there. This is just a quick summary on how different uh, type of steel um, uh, sections are or they look like. Again, we will have a detailed lecture on this uh, coming up. So, this is just to give you a flavor of what you can expect in the coming lectures. Now, properties of these different iron and iron products. Uh, and steel, let us look at corrosion resistant of course, cast iron, wrought iron etcetera has higher corrosion resistance than the steel just because of the energy uh, consumption I already discussed that. And then uh, ultimate strength of course, you will steel will have much higher strength uh, as compared to other products. But uh, let us look at this graph here, pure iron it is very, very less as com a pure iron ultimate strength is somewhere about. 60, 70 something like that a KSI. Okay, that KSI stands for kips per square inch. Okay, kips per square inch. Okay, that is KSI. Okay, it is uh, uh, you know uh, similar to the uh, mega Pascal. Okay, now uh, cast iron is somewhat in between the wrought iron and the pure iron. 
and then as you go for steel you see that the strength keep on increasing you look at this red arrows over there the strength keep on increasing you have high carbon steel where strength is much higher than the mild steel and not only strength you also see that elastic properties here the slope of these these curves also keep changing that means modulus of elasticity also is increasing okay and uh, so the, the uh, if you have a stress strain behavior a graph you can actually learn a lot about various products and now also you see mild steel you have a plateau region here okay you have plateau region which is missing in this high carbon steel because because of a lot of uh, you know elements present the alloying action you have a gradual transition rather than a well defined yield point okay so that these are all the different features uh, of the blue arrows indicate kind of the yield strength and you can see that there is a plateau uh, up to mild yield but uh, in the high carbon alloy steel there is no plateau yield plateau and the brittleness and ductility as you can see here as you can see uh, the uh, brittleness and ductility so here you can see that ductility keep on decreasing okay if i look at this so ductility for the pure iron is much higher ductility is higher or the percent elongation is going to be higher but as compared to the high carbon steel so as the strength is keep on increasing there is a general trend that ductility decreases but nowadays we have products where uh, within a particular range of products you can still change the chemical composition and still get that ductility uh, even with higher strength so that that's all uh, possible but this is just a general discussion on how uh, pure iron cast iron wrought iron mild steel and high carbon steel uh, behaves okay so to, to summarize we looked at uh, how uh, the uh, these four materials cast iron ductile iron wrought iron and steel are produced uh, in general and what are the major properties of this and how the carbon content actually influences the uh, uh, the ductility the strength the hardness etc uh, so with that we will just uh, close this lecture thank you